Support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum. Located in Jennings City Hall, the museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is a historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. Additional support provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. The data is there, the information is there, but we just basically have ignored it for five years and now we are in worse shape than we were five years ago. The new report card on Louisiana's infrastructure and the results are abysmal. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow and this is the state we're in. More on that report card in a moment, but first a look at the week's headlines. Governor John Bell Edwards announced that more than $220 million in federal dollars will soon head to Metro Baton Rouge. The Hazard Mitigation Grant Program money can be used to improve drainage, elevate homes, and buy out homes that have flooded repeatedly. $4.9 million more dollars is going to northwest Louisiana, namely Caddo Parish. You can add that to $22 million already received there. A balloon release at BRPD headquarters marked the one-year anniversary of a lone gunman's ambush of officers that left three dead and three others wounded. That attack a year ago, July 17th, followed the shooting death by police of Alton Sterling. Officers Montrell Jackson and Matthew Gerald of BRPD lost their lives that day last summer, along with EBR Sheriff's Deputy Brad Garofola. Three other officers were wounded, including Deputy Nick Toulier, wounded critically. He remains in a rehabilitation center in Houston. Tragic day for uh, Baton Rouge. Um, anytime officers involved in shootings, it's, it's difficult for a community, uh, particularly the last several years. Uh, those things, right or wrong, whether 100% right like this, have a tendency to fracture relationships and communities that historically have issues, and Baton Rouge is no different. DA Moore praised the bravery of officers and citizens who found themselves in the middle of the horror last summer. Oil spilled seven years ago in the Deepwater Horizon disaster in the Gulf of Mexico might no longer be visible, but it's still taking a toll on Louisiana's fragile wetlands. A new LSU study indicates that crude oil from the 2010 BP oil spill has become lodged in wetland soils where it remains almost as toxic as the day it flowed into the Gulf. Dolores Ferdinand Marsalis, matriarch of one of New Orleans' great musical families, died Tuesday, July 18th, of pancreatic cancer. She was 80 years old. She was the wife of the influential New Orleans jazz pianist Ellis Marsalis and mother of four famous jazz musicians, Branford, Wenton, Ellis, and Del Feo Marsalis. Also in the news, could former LSU football coach Les Miles become a lead contender for the job at Ole Miss? Well, the possibility is trending big right now, only because of a shocking announcement Thursday night that Rebel coach Hugh Freeze had been forced to resign. The Ole Miss chancellor and athletic director said the forced ouster had nothing to do with an ongoing NCAA investigation into Ole Miss football. Instead, they cited a one-minute call on Freeze's university-issued cell phone to a female escort service as a red flag. The school says that led them to discover a troubling pattern of behavior not acceptable to them. Freeze led Ole Miss to back-to-back -back wins over Alabama and a 2016 Sugar Bowl victory in the last three years. He also beat LSU and Miles in 2015, but lost to the Tigers last year. Miles has said he wants to coach again, so we will see. For now, Ole Miss has promoted assistant coach Matt Luke to interim head coach. Louisiana may need to again take out a short-term loan to keep cash flowing to agencies and bills on track for payment. The State Bond Commission, which oversees state borrowing, agreed Thursday to move forward with the process to borrow up to half a billion dollars this budget year. A final decision will be made in the coming weeks once cash flow projections are complete. The state has had, of course, fewer cash reserves than it once had. Some good news, though, for Louisiana and businesses for a record eighth straight year. Business Facilities Magazine ranks LED's Fast Start as the nation's number one state workforce training program. In the magazine's 2017 state rankings report, Louisiana also earned a number one ranking for cybersecurity growth potential and additional top 10 rankings among the best states for business costs, economic growth, and also exports.
Well, you know, this week has been filled with back and forth over President Trump's desire to repeal and replace Obamacare, but so far no deal. His party is divided. Then on Thursday, Trump ended Affordable Care Act contracts that brought assistance into libraries and businesses in New Orleans and 17 other cities. It means shoppers on insurance exchanges will have fewer places to turn for help to sign up for coverage. The week also saw a group of GOP senators come out against majority leader Mitch McConnell's plans to revamp health care. What does this all mean for you, for us in Louisiana? LPB's Kelly Spires spoke with a state insurance company leader and a local think tank advocate. Let's start with what's wrong with health care today. Michael Berto is a health care economist with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana. If you don't attract a healthy balance of people who are older and younger, who are male and female, who are sicker and less sick, you run the risk of an increasing rate of premiums that allows the healthier folks to opt out of the pool. And as more people opt out on the healthy side, the pool becomes less healthy. That drives rates up and you enter into what's been called popularly a death spiral. And that's exactly what's happening. Most of the ire comes from folks who are enrolled in the individual marketplace through healthcare.gov. If I'm a single and I make $50,000 a year or more, I'm not going to get any assistance from anyone to pay for my coverage, and my rates doubled in three years. So you can see where that might set up a chain reaction of people being a little irritated at the insurance marketplace. Most of those people are freelancers or folks who own their own small business. That's only 220,000 people in Louisiana. Today in Louisiana, 50% of the people who buy an individual policy in the current marketplace get absolutely no assistance. So even if it's only 100,000 people, that's 100,000 people whose rates have doubled and who are relatively unhappy. That market, for several reasons, is unstable today, making rates for those who are still enrolled hard to handle. A stable risk pool should look a lot like the population it lives in. So Louisiana is 51% female. We would like the risk pool to be 51% female. Instead, it's almost 60%. Now, the only reason that's a problem is because at certain ages, ladies use more health care than men do. After a certain age, men use more health care. So it skews the pool, and it, in, you end up having to charge more than you would have normally. Generally, young people are healthier and need to go to the doctor less often. These low-risk people need to have insurance so that care for high-risk people can be affordable to the insurance company. Due to federal regulations under Obamacare, the ratio of what folks pay is 3 to 1. For every dollar a 21-year-old pays, a 64-year-old pays $3 in premium. And that sounds a little punitive. Unfortunately, re the reality is the 64-year-old is going to use seven times as much health care as the 21-year-old does. So leaving that ratio at three to one actually overcharges the younger folks pretty dramatically. They're using more care, but the ratio is still unbalanced because they generally use seven times more care than younger folks. Well, our risk pool, for example, should be around 34 years old on average. It's 45 years old on average because the current pricing scheme disadvantages 25 to 30 year olds, their rates are way higher than they should be, to give a discount to people my age. The biggest problem is that it's too easy to jump in and out of the market only when you're sick. That leaves the folks on insurance paying more than they should. Berto says only 40 percent of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana enrollees pay 12 premiums in a row. The people who joined during special enrollment used four times as much care as the people who didn't join during special enrollment, and they only stayed with us an average of five months. So, you know, when you see that behavior time and time again, it's pretty obvious that people are jumping in when they really need care, getting the care they need, and jumping back out, and that destabilizes the pool. Another issue with the individual marketplace is with folks who get subsidies. The government has threatened to stop paying these subsidies. These problems make it very expensive for insurers to do business in the individual markets. But you may have heard on the national news about companies pooling out in other states. We've lost $250 million in the individual market here in Louisiana. But we are, and our board of directors has affirmed this, a not-for-profit, mission-driven health insurance provider. And Louisiana is our only territory. 
So we are going to do everything possible to stabilize the individual market. We are not going to run away. There's another sect of the population that's gained insurance coverage in Louisiana under Medicaid expansion. That's at risk of being taken away under several of the Senate plans. More than 430,000 of our friends and neighbors have already gained coverage, many of them for the first time in their lives. They've actually had insurance coverage, and they are benefiting so strongly from that. The idea that they would roll back that funding is, is, um, is not good, not something we'd want to see happen. Nick Alvarez with the Louisiana Budget Project advocates for that population. There have been hundreds of cancers that have been averted by people having access to care. And, you know, those are people's parents uh, people's brothers and sisters, uh, people's kids. And, and in Louisiana, losing the federal share of Medicaid dollars could sap funding the state sends to schools and other state services. The state would be in a position where they would have virtually impossible decisions about who to cover or what to cut, both in the health care budget or elsewhere in order to make things work with that much federal funding coming away. Healthcare might be complicated, but Alvarez says when you boil it down, lawmakers in D.C. face two choices. At the end of the day, people are concerned about rising costs, rising out-of-pocket costs. And in, in reality, the only way to change that, and, and the only way to bring prices down, would either be to provide more money to help offset those costs in the form of tax credits, or you know, to really look at the drivers of medical costs. And that's a really big discussion. But you know, to talk about things like the price of prescription drugs, uh, the price of services, and to do innovative things to bring those prices down. But there's, there are no easy fixes here. For LPB, I'm Kelly Spires. A look now at Louisiana's 2017 infrastructure report card. The great given comes from 50 of the state's top civil engineers and also colleagues from the American Society of Civil Engineers. For 18 months, they meticulously assessed the 11 components that make up our infrastructure. And what is so disappointing and a concern to them is that the 2017 grade showed no improvement from the one in 2012. The grade of D-plus is defined as poor and is sounding alarms. It concludes our infrastructure is poorly maintained, inadequately funded, and not designed to meet tomorrow's demands. Five years have passed and we have done nothing. Kim Avasagi is an accomplished and honored civil engineer and was DOTD secretary under Governor Mike Foster. He is the report card executive director. Like 2012, the 2017 report card urged the state to take immediate action, but that has not happened. The data is there, the information is there, but we just basically have ignored it for five years and now we are in worse shape than we were five years ago. This is that leaky roof that first you start with the drops and you don't take care of those drops and then it becomes more of a run and then finally you have to change the whole roof. Take traffic for example which is something anyone driving through Baton Rouge, not just at rush hour, but often at any hour, can understand. Baton Rouge has the highest congestion rate in the state. And the fact of the matter is, when you and I sit in traffic for an hour to get to where we want to go, that is in one hour a wasted time. Movasagi cringes about the hidden costs associated with roads and highways and bridges. Waiting in traffic is one. There's also wear and tear on cars and trucks, the price of insurance, which is among the highest in the nation, and accidents. The report says Louisiana drivers in urban areas are paying between $18 and $2,500 a year in those hidden costs. We're paying for all of this. We don't know that we're paying for it. And a lot of these costs could be reduced if we had better roads, if we had less congested roads, if we had safer roads, that we wouldn't be killing as many people on the roads as we are now. Movasagi says there are vital top of the list mega projects all over the state. Lake Charles Bridge is an important 
I would say Baton Rouge Bridge is important because the congestion cost is a real cost, is a real cost that you and I are paying for it. So Baton Rouge needs relief. Uh, the the I-49, completion of I-49, it provides an alternate route to bypass Baton Rouge to go to New Orleans if you're coming from west. And, and that, could, that could also help, so that needs to be done. The state's bridges, a grade of D plus. Well, Vasagi says 44% are functionally obsolete and don't meet modern day safety standards. One in four are fracture critical, meaning failure of a single component would possibly cause a portion or the entire bridge to collapse. These bridges were designed for a 50 year lifespan. And now they are reaching about 70% of their lifespan. So they're getting old. They look like me, okay? Well, Vasagi says when a bridge closes for repairs, like this one on Nicholson Drive in Baton Rouge near LSU, it costs taxpayers money. He says being proactive in repairs and construction is what needs to be done. What about the state's airports? They receive some of the highest grades in this survey. They are doing well. Baton Rouge, Shreveport, Alexandria, Monroe, and Lake Charles all have newer terminals. And New Orleans? Construction of a new state-of-the-art terminal at Armstrong International is expected to propel the Crescent City into the upper echelon of the world's airports. Lafayette Parish voters will consider a one-cent sales tax for eight months. Lafayette's airport commission spelled out their needs to the public for a new terminal, and the response... The public overwhelmingly voted for that because the money was specifically identified where it needs to go. And then the commission, when it reached the goal that they had, like $33 million, they stopped the tax. They didn't even let the tax go until the end of the year. The report card grades coastal infrastructure, inland waterways, dams, levees, and ports, plus solid waste and wastewater. The majority got C's, much room for improvement. Well, Vasaki tells me there is promise looking ahead, though, especially with plans for coastal restoration. Drinking water got a D minus. Most systems are old and deteriorating. Wabasaki says it is critical for the state to increase funding and raise the grade of its drinking water infrastructure. DOTD Secretary Sean Wilson, you have seen the results of the 2017 Louisiana Infrastructure Report Card. Your reaction to that? We've earned the grade that we've gotten. And unfortunately today, as I'm at Scout Jamboree with Troop 4104, we closed three bridges today in Vermilion Parish, three off-system bridges. Uh, that all needed structural work. And so we know that the data that they've looked at, uh, the results that they've produced, are in fact what the results are. What could DOTD do to get their message across to the public in a better way? I think if DOTD does a bit more of, of explaining to the public in a way that public understands, public appreciates, I think they would be much more successful with regard to their public relation issues. Mavasagi says it leaves us with much to do, but he's not optimistic much will get done. I am disappointed. A state that I love, a state that I live in, a state that my family lives in, my grandchildren live in. And, and I hate to see that we are not talking about these kind of issues. Now, if you want to see the full report, which includes the grade for each state, go to infrastructurereportcard.org. Well, now moving into the ninth year, the ninth annual Baton Rouge Irish Film Festival, and it kicks off Monday night, July 24th at Phil Brady's Bar and Grill. It relocates then downtown to the Manship Theater in the Shaw Center on Friday and Saturday, July 28th and 29th. Award-winning features, documentaries, and short films are in the lineup. Photographer Rex Q. Fortenberry gives us a preview here. We kick off the event with our pub night, which will happen at Phil Brady's on Government Street. We're going to show a short film called Love at First Light and a feature film called Pacoon. Pacoon is based on a book by British and Irish comedian Spike Milligan. 
It's the unfortunate story of a rural Irish village when in 1924, the Boundary Commission, while deciding on the new line between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic, splits the town right down the middle, dividing house from outhouse, man from wife, and pub chairs from bars. Friday night, July 28th at the Manship Theatre, the festival presents We Irish Film Night, featuring 10 of the best Irish short films of 2017, one of which will be voted Best Audience Film. So we're excited about the lineup of short films this year. Once again, it's a little something for everybody. We've got drama, we've got comedy, we've got documentary, and so it's really a little something for everybody. It's going to be a very tough pick. We can do all this at the Chelsea Flower Show. Let's throw a lifeline to the wilderness. From the green hills of Ireland to the desert highlands of Africa to London's Chelsea, Dare to be Wild is the true, against all odds, romantic adventure of Mary Reynolds, a modern day heroine and her quest to show the world the power of wild nature as she reaches for her dreams by affecting environmental change, one garden, one vast desert at a time. It was designed as a place to dream. She wants to bring something different to Chelsea. She wants to bring her love of nature and the wildness of Ireland. So she transports a garden from the west of Ireland to the Chelsea Flower Show, and she does it in three weeks' time. A Day for Mad Mary is about that character, Mad Mary, who is, uh, that's her nickname. Right. She gets released from jail, she goes back to her hometown, and she finds herself struggling to fit back into the old uh, ways that she had. Back home, everything and everyone has changed. Her best friend, Charlene, is about to get married, and Mary is to be her maid of honor. Oh, look. Like a whore. I believe you're looking to find someone to go to a wedding. When Charlene refuses Mary a plus one on the grounds that she probably couldn't find a date, Mary becomes determined to prove her wrong. It's a story of uh, some redemption and some finding right. yourself. Nobody ever got used to the violence that engulfed the community. There was a great need to take the kids out of Northern Ireland. This year's free documentary, How to Defuse a Bomb, the Project Children's Story, reveals the untold story of how an NYPD bomb disposal expert, Dennis McKay, played a key role in helping defuse the decades-old troubles in Northern Ireland. And it worked because they took both the Protestant children and the Catholic children, and they let them come to America together, and they spent six weeks swimming and playing and being on a plane and just being children and not have to worry about whether or not I'm going to get shot when I go to the store or if a bomb's going to blow up as I'm on my way to church or something like that. Along with his family and neighbors in small town New York, he started a scheme that would ultimately see 23,000 children escape the worst of the violence and in the process discover they had more in common with the enemy at home than they thought. The journey is the gripping account of how two men from opposite sides of the political spectrum come together to change the course of history. In 2006, during the ongoing decades-long conflict in Northern Ireland, representatives from the two warring factions meet for negotiations. Do I recognize you from somewhere? This is Dr. Ian Paisley, leader of the Democratic Unionist Party. And this is Martin McGuinness of the Irish Republican Army. These men are anarchy. They are the troubles. The two men upon whom this entire peace agreement depends are now by themselves in a car. Yes, Prime Minister. If they can just get over their poisonous past. Yes, I have company. No, nobody important. We are on the verge of something the waiter world will applaud, but our own people will hate. Why can we even contemplate? doing that. That's the first time you've said we. This year's closing comedy, The Flag, tells of Harry, a luckless Paddy living in London. In one day, he loses his job, father, and hamster. While home to bury his dad, he finds a statement from his grandfather claiming that he raised the flag over the general post office during the Independence Rising of 1916 and that it now hangs in an army barracks in England. 
Harry sets out to get some friends together from his homeland of Ireland and come over and steal that flag and get it back to its rightful owner. For more information on the festival, visit bririshfilmfestival.com. And a reminder now, the PBS Online Film Festival continues. This is the first week. It began on Monday, July 17th. It goes through July 28th. So just go online, watch, and vote for your favorite, and then share it. You can actually vote once a day throughout the length of the festival. Watch, share your vote, and spread the word. Louisiana Remember has two entries. We previewed both of them this month, Last Light and the short film Psy. So... Take care of business, watch, vote, and share. This week's LPB's documentaries are in high demand across America. Deeply Rooted, John Koykendall's journey to save our seeds and stories made its national premiere at the prestigious Slow Food Nation International Conference in Denver. Then in Washington, D.C. at the March on Washington Film Fest, LPB's film, Signpost to Freedom, the 1953 Baton Rouge bus boycott, was screened and followed by a panel discussion live from Google offices. The film and panel were broadcast live before a second audience. This was at the LSU Law Center here in Baton Rouge. It was terrific because there was this wonderful streaming from D.C. with our own Chris Tyson involved, and they had so many things to say on the commemoration of the March on Washington, and it is LPB's pleasure to be a sponsor. I, of course, wanted the opportunity and took advantage of it to come and learn more tonight and just to hear from the people that were actually involved in it. It was really inspiring, and it's even more so inspiring to, uh, to be able to hear it and to think and to internalize and say, okay, the curriculum still isn't in public schools here in Baton Rouge, so what can I do to ensure that kids that are in schools and that are growing up in future generations can learn about the bus boycott in Baton Rouge? So. The annual March on Washington Film Festival celebrates important events in civil rights history in America, attracting more than a thousand people to events over two weeks to venues around the nation's capital. Hey, did you or a family member or someone you know serve in the Vietnam War? If so, LPB wants to preserve and share the story. Every Wednesday, LPB invites you to our studios in Baton Rouge to record your Vietnam experience. You can also share your history with us of videos, photos, or written stories at lpb.org slash Vietnam. To learn more about scheduling an interview, go to our website, or you can simply call us at 225-767-4204. And that's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download is free from your app store. On it, you can catch LPB news and public affairs shows, as well as other Louisiana programs that you have come to enjoy over the years. And please, like us on Facebook as well. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks so much for watching us. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter and visit lpb.org where you can view more stories and leave us a comment. This program is available on DVD. Support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum. Located in Jennings City Hall, the museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is a historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. Additional support provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you.